Hello and welcome to this edition of Insights and Sounds. My name is Martin Preston. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Bristol School of Education. And I have the pleasure to have with us today, Dr. Robert Sharples. Robert is a lecturer in the language and education at the University of Bristol School of Education also. His research focuses on what happens when globally mobile young people encounter educational institutions and how we can improve those institutions to work with those mobile learn and multilingual learners. Dr. Sharple has recently released a book entitled Teaching EAL Evidence-Based Strategies for the Classroom and School. And today we're going to focus on some of the ideas within that book. Um, so welcome, Rob. Hi. Um, so first of all, I was I would like to ask you. So what do you think the key themes are within the book um, that are most useful for practitioners and for researchers in the field that they could take away? I wonder if you could just introduce the book and some of those themes. Yeah, so the book is called Teaching EAL. And of course, EAL, or English as an additional language, it, it won't be a familiar term to a lot of people. It's a, it's a term used in the education system for bilingual learners. But that covers a huge variety of, of different experiences, of different language proficiencies, of different levels of literacy and so on. So the book is an attempt to, to give teachers and others a toolkit for dealing with that diversity in a, an evidence-based way. So I talk a lot about putting evidence at the service of practice and, and helping people to build up those evidence-based principles that they can use to make teaching decisions. We're not here to tell people how to teach, but, but really to help people understand what happens when they make the decisions that they do. So there's three sections in the book. The first one is about how um, additional languages are acquired and learned and what the difference between those is. And that's really important because a lot of what we know about second language acquisition comes from studies of people who are learning a foreign language in the classroom but but not in the country they live in so uh, bilingual children coming to school here are in an english-speaking country and so their experience of language is going to be really different to someone for example taking a french or german class the second part is um, all about how language works in the school and i think it's really important for teachers and really for everyone in education to know that that language is part of every discipline. So the language of mathematics is part of the subject knowledge of a maths teacher. The language of, of science or PE or geography is part of those teachers' subject knowledge. And too often I think we see that language is something that happens over here, that the language teacher teaches language and then those students can come into a subject classroom. And it's just, it's just not the case. So by looking at how language works in each subject, we can equip teachers then to, to support bilingual pupils in the mainstream classroom. So having built up that body of background knowledge, the third part is about how we put it into practice. And it, it's split into two really. Typical academic, right? Anything has three answers, a two part answer and so on. Um, the first half of that last section is about what happens if you're new in post. So what's the first thing you need to do your first day when you're just given this job? Because a lot of, of language specialist teachers in schools are just given the job they don't have a, an existing specialism so how do you how do you get through your first week your first term your first year what do you need to put in place for for good provision to happen the the second part is what if you're an experienced teacher and you want to maybe extend your practice by by leading others by developing um, a language rich education across your school or across the, your um, region um, and not just in your own classroom. So uh, taken in sequence then, hopefully we've, we've set up the background knowledge that every teacher needs to know, whether they're uh, identify themselves as a, as a language teacher, an EAL teacher or ELL, it's often known in the US for, for English language learner or not. And then taking it through to turn that into really rich um, teaching and learning and also like systems, the policies, the procedures in the school to make that happen and hopefully taken as a whole it's it's a bit of a route map to to just making education work better for bilingual children okay great Th thanks very much that's, that's really interesting especially as uh being an ex-teacher myself um working with uh, young people coming from lots of different uh places with um being multilingual learners um, so I'm really interested, particularly in the, in that, that latter that latter section of, of the book, 
Um, so you use case studies in in your in your book, uh, a number of case studies. Um, you, the one is on Ofsted, um, and there are um, an, a number. There's one focused on Year Eleven, I believe. Um, how how was how was the use of case studies um, important for you? And how, what does it what how does it help um, us understand further? The, um, the areas that you're covering and, and and improving the provision that you're talking about for multilingual learners? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the case studies really came first. So um, some years ago, I was, uh, I was involved with the Subject Association, which runs a network of regional groups for teachers around the country. And we got reports from the regional groups, sometimes from quite upset group conveners saying, oh, well, I, you know, I, I tried this and I talked about this and I just got knocked back. And, and the book started um, really because I was badgering the publisher. We've got a, a great specialist publisher based here in Bristol, Multilingual Matters, and they are, you know, absolutely fantastic and, and committed to publishing really important work in this area. And I kept asking, well, look, we're getting these queries, we're getting these questions, but all we find is top tips for Monday morning book or, you know, research tomes that no one's got time to read. Why can't we have something that responds to these questions, these queries, these challenges? And, and the ultimate answer, of course, was, well, you know, why don't you write it? So we did. And, and the, the original proposal for the book was basically drawn from all those different real world questions, challenges, complaints, myths, misconceptions, um, which led into the first two sections of the book. And, and in a sense, the, the case studies, um, although, although now they look like they're brought into a, an academic book, they're the heart and soul of it to start with. So the case studies take different subject areas, but also different phases. The, the English one, that you, sorry, year 11 one that you mentioned is about teaching poetry to year 11. And of course, these are all things that we assume bilingual children can't do. Right? You can't do poetry. You've got to master survival English first. But actually the techniques that make poetry teaching successful for any teacher, about unpacking the language, about giving students hooks, to hang their existing knowledge on and so on, work really, really well with bilingual children. Um, there's others, you know, we've got one from um, the primary classroom looking at the language of mathematics, which is really, really important. But that's again, something we often think of as, as a secondary subject, like when maths becomes, you know, a, a big core subject and a, and a GCSE and a distinct discipline. Um, but actually, you know, mathematics and numeracy are, are all through the curriculum in primary. And I thought it was really important to show that that language and maths go together from such an early stage. But other case studies take a different view. So we've got a brilliant one from Pam Coles in Wales who, who looks at how as a local authority, they had to rethink their whole approach across the local authority area when the budgets were slashed. And they couldn't be out in every school anymore. And what that resulted in was something really positive. They, they began to see their role as building capacity in the schools rather than doing the work for the schools. And, and that only came about really because they couldn't do that anymore. And so all the case studies, they, I, I, mean, I think they're the best bit to be honest. And, and the six case study contributors um, are fantastic. Um, but each one of them is about showing how it works um, in reality. So this is not, you know, this is not some highfalutin, this is how you should do it. This is how people are, are putting good practice in place. Just day in day out so we've, we've got a brilliant one um, from Erica Field about working with families and, and she talks about in Oldham and she says well the first thing you do is you put the kettle on and in the time it takes to make the tea that's when all the nerves settle out of it and she says we make sure everyone's got a cup of tea we bring translators in yes it's really expensive but it is really important and I talk for a bit and they translate for a bit and I wait for a bit and I talk for a bit and they translate for a bit and I wait for a bit and it's the slowness the slowing down of that rhythm of a hectic school day which is where um, she creates space for parents to actually be able to ask questions and engage in the education just making spaces that work on a teacher's timetable doesn't work for for parents who are on the margins of the education system so all these case studies are, are, are really about yes showing how it works but also getting to what really matters which is how bit by bit you 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 fight that good fight of, of getting really strong provision into place for for pupils okay fantastic i mean this um the, the way that you positioned it, uh, the text as being in between you know those mm. uh, i've read them myself as a teacher 
you know, five things you can do and and you read a list, one for maths, one for history, you know, as a primary school teacher, you know, all of a sudden you're an expert in everything, uh, every subject, plus looking after children and the special needs, et cetera. Um, but that your that your position is some, something that's informed and it's drawing on those multiple case studies. And uh, I agree, these case studies are really powerful. Um, so perhaps going to put you on the spot a little bit now, as my my interests are, are in policy as well. So uh, two two questions. Firstly, in my previous life as a teacher, what do you think the um, the main takeaways would be? And then, and then, as uh, someone working in policy, what do you think the, the the most fundamental changes that that you've observed or that you mm. think need to happen? Um, maybe you've seen it in some specific locations, but you, but needs to become more widespread across the system. Um, so those two, there's two questions really about the, the the focus for for teachers. So I'm going to ask you for those. Yeah, those for sure, for uh, sure. So I'm I'm really glad you've put teachers as policymakers together because I think that's really really important. We often think of teachers as the ones who have done to or who implement, but it's it's nonsense. I mean I mean policy is nothing without the people who turn it into practice. It doesn't mean anything. So. Um, uh, what's the most important takeaway for teachers well i think for teachers and teachers as policy makers the first thing about the book is it's it's an argument just by existing that this matters that people who see themselves as perhaps um on the margins of their own school system or of their own schools perhaps less highly valued than people who teach particular subjects and so on as some kind of auxiliary actually you know there is a huge body of knowledge behind what yale teachers do or people who who focus on supporting bilingual children and that work uh, matters and it should be high status so the book itself just the existence of a book i think is an argument for for greater status for language teaching and language teachers in schools i think that's really really important and if it does anything i I'm, I'm, uh, hope i hope that it gives people confidence that their work really does matter in terms of specific things you can do in your classroom well you know there, there's a good 60 or so pages of um, I think it's about 14 tasks of step by step, you know, how you build up your role. I think one of the things I've tried to do, though, is is um, structure it to make a long term difference. So how do you welcome pupils come sometime after working out what policies your school has? Because if you're trapped on welcoming your arrivals every week, that's fine. and It's important, but you're never going to be able to grow what you do because you're always responding to what's urgent and not always what's important, which can sometimes be different. So, so helping people to see the value of their work and, and to build for the long term, I think makes for a rewarding career. And, and that's what you want people to, to see themselves as having. Um, the policy, the kind of the national policy question is, is difficult because um, it's, it, what happened in 2010 with the new government coming in was tremendously uh, disruptive to the sector. So that's not just the academy's um, academization. And I'm, you know, I'm an academy map trustee myself. I'm, I'm sort of fairly neutral on, on academies as a concept. But one thing it did is that it moved expertise from local authorities into trusts. But that expertise didn't previously exist in trusts, and it didn't transfer. So one possibly unintended side effect of um, of the shift was that we just hemorrhaged expertise out of the system and it's not in teacher education it's been fairly systematically stripped out of uh, the teacher standards of um, the inspection framework and inspectors handbooks all guidance has been pretty much withdrawn apart from a couple of four page pamphlets and so on so um, if you're a new teacher coming into the profession you might get 90 minutes in most places on EAL um, and, and that's about it. So I think that that has been part of, there's been partly unintended consequences, but partly neglect. And, and a big part of it, I think is actually quite deliberate because it's too associated with migration, even though the vast majority of bilingual children were born in this country, a second or third generation um, bilinguals. So at a school level, it's, it's recognizing that this really matters and the people who are doing it are highly skilled professionals. I think at, a, at a, a national policy level, well, I've, I, yeah. 
we'll pretend that this is just a private conversation, Martin. Let's just say that I personally, I'm like, I don't see much value in working with Westminster at the minute. I, I think um, there's much more interesting conversations to be have, had at the, at the level of trusts and, and at the level of um, regions, for example, and with local authorities still, because I think they're more open to, to what works. Um, and, and that's perhaps where we need to base um, our arguments next, you know, one and a half million children and more that's one in five pretty much of, of children in our school system are bilingual did they going to grow up as they have been and have children who will probably grow up bilingual so divorcing it from the migration argument this is this is a um, a normal as constant called it just a normal and everyday part of our schooling the fact that we think we need to treat it as something exceptional is is a real challenge so policy wise i'd hope to normalize it um, and just to get this expertise back in, ideally through teacher education and, and professional development. And, you know, with colleagues, we're, we're working on, on ways to do that. OK, that's I mean, that's two really good take, takeaways to, you know, to, to normalise it as it as it should be and to, and to strengthen the expertise. Mm. Um, so thanks very much, Rob, for, for talking to us uh, today about about your book and the the. the the status of the the field really um it's been a pleasure to talk to you uh, we're out of time unfortunately mm -hmm. um for joining us today for insights and sounds and um for sharing us your thoughts uh about the state of the field and the important takeaways from your from your um book teaching eal evidence-based strategies for the classroom and school um and uh yeah that's it from us today thank you thank you